Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. Well, wow, this is a emotionally up and down meeting, isn't it? Um, well, a roller coaster. But now we're going to go on to something a little bit more optimistic, and I'd love to introduce a good friend of ours, Daniel Cole. Uh, he's president of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation and serves on the director, board of directors. He's a neuroanesthesiologist at UCLA, uh, and he was a past president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. The American uh, Patient Safety Foundation is one we do work with closely because they've shown success. 60 years ago, one in 10,000 patients who got an anesthetic died, one in 10,000. Today, it's one in 200 plus thousand, uh, and we're taking on all comers. I mean, major transplants, most frail patients. Uh, and so they're a good organization to work with and learn from, and how do they do it? So with that, I'd like to welcome Dan Cole to the stage. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Dan Cole. Well, thank you, uh, Mike, for this. Are my slides up? There we go. Okay. Um, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a journey in the next uh, 12 minutes or thereabouts uh, of the anesthesia patient safety uh, movement. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our organization, but I want to start this off by saying that anesthesiology is a technology-rich specialty. Uh, and so it's going to be a little bit of an emphasis on technology, but the caveat is that I went into anesthesiology because of the patient communication that I could have. There's no other specialty where you have just a few minutes to capture the patient's trust before parents give you their child to take back uh, into that black hole of the operating room. Uh, children give you their aged parent to go back uh, when knowing that they're very frail uh, and unstable. And that human-to-human -human communication I think is very special in our specialty. The other part is, is that there's not necessarily verbal communication, uh, but if you're the patient, I am by your side throughout that entire period. And we're talking, we're communicating. I'm thinking as though you are my brother, my sister, my parent, my daughter, but I'm being fed rich streams of data upon which I need to make decisions. And you saw yesterday how quickly, uh, when you see those screens, uh, we make uh, uh, decisions. But we can do better with uh, new, new technology. My story, my own personal story, is uh, pale in comparison to uh, some of the stories that you've heard today from uh, parents. But one of the worst days of my life, and everything turned out great, was when my three-year-old son went in for an inguinal hernia orophy. I picked the surgeon, picked the anesthesiologist, knew exactly what was uh, going on in that black hole. But again, when you turn over your loved one uh, to, in my case, people that I knew very well, it's still very emotional. I had another personal story where my father went in for coronary artery bypass surgery. A fairly robust uh, man, but this was the person that I knew his strength, his uh, uh, stableness uh, throughout my life. Uh, but I also knew that he was 85 years old, and although he was healthy, he was at high risk of post-operative cognitive dysfunction. And indeed, everything turned out well, except he only came back to about 90% of what he was. He suffered uh, from delirium, and that was probably because he was at a high risk of uh, suffering that disease. Uh, I doubt anything was uh, done wrong in there. Uh, but, but again, it's very traumatic when things don't go right within a healthcare system. Let me see. There we go. I first I want to thank uh, Joe, Mike, Mike, and Sanas uh, for inviting me here today. It's always a privilege to come here. I think I've attended probably five or six of these uh, in uh, my uh, career. And it's always so energetic uh, learning. But more importantly, I want to thank 
uh, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for the collaboration that they have with the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And what we do together uh, attacks that mountain of patient safety issues that we have to deal with. Working in silos doesn't work. Working together, I think, helps a lot more. We're a foundation of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, we just uh, had our meeting in Boston, celebrating the 40th year of the meeting that took place prior to our formation in uh, 1985. And if you go quickly over the timeline of the anesthesia patient safety movement, when we were in Boston, we toured the Ethodorm Dome, uh, kind of where it all started for our profession. And if we didn't have the collaboration, I think, between uh, people professionally, patients, and people in industry, I would still be given ether. Uh, which does not work uh, very well. There's been tremendous collaboration, and I'll go over that here in a few minutes. But 1848, um, 1846 was with the ether demonstration at the ether dome. 1848 was the first reported death from uh, anesthesia, someone that aspirated uh, from anesthesia. Fast forward uh, to 1954, a Beecher and Todd report, and Mike kind of quoted about one in 1,500 patients died uh, from anesthesia. Today, because of some of the innovations, and again, I'll go over those uh, quickly here in just a moment or two, it's about one in 200,000 uh, that die from anesthesia. 1982, and this is how things get done in America. There was a program on 2020, Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs here uh, presented the deep sleep and talked about the dangers of anesthesia. And that generated a lot of public response of how we must make anesthesia safer. And then in 1986, uh, we were formed. What we do, uh, we uh, support research. Uh, we uh, educate people both online and, and at an annual conference uh, that we have where we develop consensus recommendations on a hot topic in patient safety. And I'll go over a couple, three of those here in just a minute. We have a newsletter that's uh, translated into nine languages and is read by 700,000 people conservatively uh, each year. We're very collaborative, again, under, underscoring our collaboration with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And we're collaborative with many, many other uh, organizations. A huge communication uh, platform, our internet and social media. And although we don't have the infrastructure to participate in advocacy, basically that falls on me, we have uh, participated a little bit in uh, pushing our ideas, pushing our solutions forward where decisions are made, such as Washington state capitals and locally. We just finished um, medication errors and we hope to generate a manuscript that will have recommendations on avoiding medication errors. Unfortunately, or fortunately, this is the third time that we've had a symposium on medication errors. It continues to plague our specialty, continues to plague uh, medicine in general. Next year, we'll have a conference on obstetric uh, safety in Chicago. I would note that these are free and that uh, we have a, a virtual option if indeed uh, you would like to uh, participate but you don't want to travel to Chicago. Let me get into our conference last year but give you a little bit of a prelude here. There's a lot of things that we need to work on uh, to get from our present state uh, to the ideal state. But technology is something that we must underscore. Technology, it feels like uh, we're on the cusp of an ether moment where technology is going to have a breakthrough and is going to transform how we do medicine how we make a safer care for uh, patients, uh, et cetera. And I can't uh, emphasize that uh, anymore. But I think it's important also to realize technology's place. Technology, at least for the moment, is not going to re replace the human-to-human -human interaction that must be there 
I think uh, the patient to caregiver interaction is so important, but technology is going to enhance and enable uh, what we do to make uh, care safer and deliver a high, higher quality. Here's what has happened in my career within anesthesiology. When I was a resident, and any of you that are in anesthesiology can appreciate this, uh, we anesthetized people with a signal mammometer, and uh, we gave them biopentol, we gave them a volatile gas called infloorine, uh, where if the patient was properly anesthetized, their blood pressure was extremely low. If uh, their blood pressure was good, they were moving. And uh, we had very difficult time with uh, intubating uh, patients uh, from time to time. And there were no entitled CO2 monitors. There was no pulse oximetry. And uh, so we found out very late in the game uh, how much trouble we were in. What's happened over the past 20 to the 30 years is that we had entitled CO2 monitors. We had the uh, pulse oximeter, which has revolutionized uh, the safety of uh, anesthesia. There are continuous non-invasive blood pressure uh, monitors uh, today. We've had new drugs that are much more forgiving than our old ones, but we have a very bright future that includes artificial intelligence, big data, uh, wearables, untethered devices that will extend our monitoring uh, beyond just the interoperative uh, period, even closed-loop uh, anesthesia, and the so-called command center, where you can be looking at 20 different screens, somebody uh, can be identifying, or even AI might identify the deteriorating patient uh, early and have an intervention earlier. This is the patient's journey, and actually this is going to be part of our, uh, that conference, that yearly conference that we have in 2026, and all of these cascade what we do preoperatively has an effect upon interoperative safety. What we do interoperatively has an effect on 30-day uh, uh, safety. What we do on 30 days has an effect on the home and chronic care. But what we like to take a focus on, and this is not necessarily a new concept, but 30-day mortality is now over 100 times greater than interoperative mortality. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, part of it is, is that interoperative mortality is that you've got a single uh, provider there taking care of a patient with all this monitoring. They get done and they think they have success once they leave the recovery room. They go to the uh, floor maybe for the initial hospitalization and you get vital signs every uh, six hours. Then they go home and nothing happens. And so, I think one of the solutions is to extend that monitoring into that 30-day uh, uh, period and identify uh, the uh, deteriorating patient uh, early on before it is uh, too late. Graphed here at the bottom showing that 30-day mortality, if indeed it were a, a disease, it would be the third leading cause of death uh, in the world. So again, there's a big gap. Uh, to, uh, to fill there. Our um, Emerging Technology uh, Symposium that was held uh, last year, what we attempted to do, that top graph there is something called the uh, Gartner Hype Curve, which applies to all emerging uh, technology. And we're probably at the peak right now, the peak of uh, irrational exuberance or inflated expectation. We think AI is the solution to everything. What typically happens is that then we go down to a trough of disillusionment and the uh, actual purpose of that meeting, and we weren't gonna do it single-handedly, but we wanted to accelerate the adaptation and the progression, the maturity of emerging technology so that we would very quickly get on that slope enlightenment and productivity. Again, there's uh, great solutions that are out there uh, in technology. We just need to all work together uh, to provide second and third generation products that are going to fulfill their promise. Here is the vision, and I think I'm on my next to last slide. Emerging technology is going to help us in the perioperative space with better imaging, better health uh, care data analytics, uh, chat box that will uh, help uh, patients and their families 
personalized medical treatments, which might include uh, preoperative evaluation with genomics. It might uh, include things like uh, uh, biosensors to make patients uh, strong uh, for surgery. It may include biomarkers, uh, et cetera. And then, like I said before, monitoring, I think, is going to be a big part, or at least a good component, of that 30-day uh, mortality solution where we would have continuous untethered uh, wearable monitors that would look at a bunch of variables, make decisions that would then uh, be made at kind of a command center uh, through AI or a human being and identify patient one, two, three. That person needs an intervention. Uh, predictive analytics would say that they're kind of on that downward slope and we're going to intervene before uh, well, we have a chance to fix it before it is uh, too late. I'll leave you with this slide. Success will be determined not only by our existing strengths, and believe me, we've come a long way, but we should not steep, stop here, but how we leverage innovation and change for a better future. Thank you very much.